Okay, so you can see for number one, I went ahead and created my boundary line there at x equals three, and everything to the left got a closed circle and was the graph of this function. Everything to the right got an open circle and was the graph of x minus one. So for number two, I'm gonna complete this in much the same way. I'm gonna create a boundary line at x equals negative one just very lightly and then between negative one and three I have another boundary and anything greater than three so I've already got the boundary line drawn for that and so to get the graph of x equals four or f of x equals four let's see I'm going to this is a less than, so I'm going to have an open circle here. I'm going to have a closed circle here, and an open circle here, and then a closed circle here. So the graph of x equals 4, f of x equals 4, is a horizontal line. So 1, 2, 3, 4, with an open circle. All right, and then my equation negative x plus one in this central region, I've got my inter uh, my y-axis, so I can use the intercept graphing method. So I go to a positive one, and then a slope of negative one looks like this, and I need an open circle on this boundary and a closed circle on this boundary. And then last but not least, one-half x minus three. So if I were using the intercept method, that would put me down here and going up and over one half. But since my boundary line doesn't start until x equals three, I'm gonna go ahead and just do a table of values and say, what is, when x is three, what is f of x equal? So plug in half times three is one and a half minus three is negative 1.5. So my initial point there It's going to be negative 1.5. So here was an open circle. So this one's going to be closed. And then my slope is a positive 1 half. So up 1 and over 2 is going to follow along right along this path here. And I can use a straight edge or. So there we go. So one thing to notice is that this function is defined all the way across from negative infinity. Here's a point where we could have a chance where it might not be defined, but when I have an open circle and a closed circle in the same space um, along the same vertical line, then that is defined. So all the way across it's defined. So my domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. My range here, though, is going to have, well, it looks like I have a gap right here, but then if I look at this line, it's increasing continuously. So that function is defined all the way through on all of these points. It goes up to positive infinity, but my issue is right here, I never get below this point is an open circle at y equals two, or negative two. So I'm gonna have that as a soft parenthesis at negative two, but then the function is defined all the rest of the places. And let me go back and just do the domain and range on problem number one. So from left to right, my function is continuously defined and my range goes from negative infinity. And because there's an, a clear overlap here, I've got values of y all the way up through infinity as well. So the range is all real numbers on that one. I'm just going to work out numbers three and four. I'd like you to work them independently and then check your answers with me. So I'm going to pause here while I work. Okay, so as you can see, I've created my boundary line and I've graphed 
f of x equals negative x plus 1. And now I've unpaused just so you can see me work out the fractions here. 2 thirds times 2 is 4 thirds plus 2 thirds is 6 thirds. So reduce that and my point at 2 is at 2, 2. And that gets an open circle. And then I'm going to rise 2 and run 3 so that I get my slope of 2 thirds. And I'm going to go ahead and graph that. So my domain goes left to right. It's defined everywhere. The deal with my range is, is that it's never below negative 1 here. So negative 1 is a minimum value and it has a closed circle on it. And, but it does go up forever to infinity. In number four, I've got a little bit tricky domains here. I'm going from negative four to negative three, negative three to negative two, negative two to negative one. So, and I've got my function here doesn't have any x's to plug in. So, if it's between negative four and negative three, and that's a closed and that's an open circle, then my function's equal to one. So. That's what that's going to look like. And I'll probably zoom in on that a little more for you. And then between negative 3 and negative 2, it's going to be equal to 2. So I'm jumping up here to 2 with a closed circle and an open circle. And then the same thing in the last one it equals 3 between negative 2 and negative 1. And that's a closed and that's an open circle. So. There's my function. So my domain is a little bit unique as well. So I've got um, nothing, no x's that are defined from negative infinity all the way up until we get to negative 4. And then right on the negative 4, that's defined. So if I were stopping there, um, so this is a place where that domain is undefined. So this is not part of my domain. I'm trying to describe what's going on here. So the only place where it is truly defined is between negative 4 and then it's not defined at negative 1, but it gets very close to it. So I'm going to not include that in my domain, but rather I'm going to start my domain at negative 4 and it's valid all the way until I get to negative 1, but not right on negative 1. So that's the only place where my function is defined in the domain. Now my range, I've got some distinct ranges here. I, I don't want to be between 1 and 3 because um, it's only defined right on the integers. So my range is actually a list of values. It's defined at 1, 2, and 3. So I'm going to use a different uh, interval notation would not be appropriate here. So that, those are three graphs. You're going to have some practice in your homework with graphing those. Um, and then we'll just use them throughout the rest of the semester. So the other thing we want to look at is to be able to work backwards and um, so let's see. So when I want to take a graph and then I want to work backwards from there, um, we got to ask where are the neighborhoods? So I'm setting up where are my domains and I need to think about the end, put, end points and then I need to know what are the functions that are part of those neighborhoods. So in looking at problem number five, formula for a line, y equals mx plus b, we need the slope and the intercept. I'm kind of jumping all over here. I'm a little bit worried because I see 
notes here. I don't have open circles or closed circles. So I'm going to have to go ahead and fill those in based on how my graph looks. So I'm going to put a closed circle here and an open circle here. And you could fill those in as well. So first of all, for line number one, I'm going to call this line number one and this line number two. Let's look at the domain. So that is defined at negative 2, and then I put a closed circle there, so it's everything less that are equal to negative 2. The slope of that line, we're going to go down 1 and over 1, so that's a negative 1 slope. The y-intercept of that line, well, that's where you have to imagine that that line is extended. So we can visually look at it we can see that that line would cross at y equals 2. It doesn't, but it would. So um, I think I have everything I need to write that one, but let's go ahead and finish with line number 2. So everything for line number 2 is everything greater than 2. The slope of that line is, let's see, go down 2 and over 1. So that slope is negative 2. And that line actually crosses at the origin. So now I have everything I need for my two, for my piecewise function. So I'm going to go ahead and fill in my domains over here. And that's supposed to be a negative two. And then my slope on this one is y equals negative x plus two, y equals. Down one and left one would be a positive slope, wouldn't it? And I can look at that line and tell that it's a positive slope. Glad I caught my mistake. Um, but here I can see that's a negative slope. Negative 2x. And then we set our intercept to 0, so we don't need a plus b at all for that one. So looking at example 6, I've got to go in and tell what my neighborhoods are. So I can see that everything's cut off at x equals 2. And I'm going to go ahead and put a closed circle there and an open circle there. So for line 1, Well, and I just added an arrow on the end there, so that kind of changes the problem, but that's okay. I'm the teacher. I'm allowed to do that. Um, so when I look at line 1, my domain is everything less than or equal to 2. And the slope of that line is 0. And the intercept of that line is right there at y equals 3. So already kind of thinking ahead to how I'm going to write this. In line number two, again, my domain is everything greater than um, x is greater than two. That's the neighborhood. Then my slope of that line is rise one and run two. So that's a one-half slope. And that line, if it were to continue and hit the y-axis, it would hit at negative three. So now I've got my two distinct neighborhoods and this equation of this horizontal line is f of x equals 3 and then for this line my equation is 1 half x minus 3 Okay, so one of the things I like about pre-calculus is that there are so many applications of all this math um, this is how most paychecks work in real life. I'm not sure if any of you have a job where you work 40 hours a week. But generally, once you get above 40 hours, you get overtime. And the rate for that is one and a half times your normal pay. So if you have a job where you make seven bucks an hour, that means, let's see, f of x 
That means if you work no hours, you make no money. But after the first hour, you've made $7. After two hours, you made $14. So the function here for your normal work week is just however many hours you work. Multiply it by 7, and that's how much money you get. But that is only for hours that are less than 40. And of course, you're not going to work below zero hours in a week. But once we get to be greater than 40, that time and a half kicks in. So let's use our calculator and let's figure out what is time and a half times our normal pay rate. So one and a half times seven, that's going to equal 10.5. So we get bumped up to 10.50 an hour after 40 hours. So I'm going to take that 10.5x and that's what my pay rate is going to look like. Okay, so we're going to number our scale here. We want to graph this. And I'm going to number my scale. I think this is a 10 by 10. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, so why don't I number by 5? So this is 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. So right here is 40 hours. So I'm going to just draw my boundary here. 40 hours is where the neighborhoods change. So my function, um, and notice I go between zero also. When I work zero hours, I get zero dollars. And when I work 40 hours, I get $280. So how am I going to number the scale on this y-axis? Let's see, I number by fives over here. I can number by fifties over here. So we'll say this is a hundred, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred. So two hundred and eighty is going to be right here. And that's going to be a closed circle because at forty hours I'll get exactly two hundred and eighty dollars. So that's my line on that part of the graph. But then once I go above 40 hours, I'm going to be at that 1050 rate. So why don't I just choose a number like, well, I could go up 10.5, but that's hard to see on my scale. So why don't I go up to 50 hours and just see what I'll make at 10.50 an hour. So this will be my overtime. So 10.50 times 50 hours, that would equal, well, do I get paid for that entire, for all the hours? Do I get paid 10.50? No, I don't. So I need a better idea of what my function's going to be. So if I work 50 hours, I get 40 of those hours, I get $7. If I, so every hour that I work above 40, I get 1050. So it's, if it's 50, that would do 50 minus 40 and get 10, 10 times 1050. So, I'll take my number of hours and I'll take away that original 40 because I've got the 40 right here. And then that'll be times 1050. So, this equation is a little more complicated than what I had initially put down. But I think it more accurately reflects how much I get paid. So, let me figure out for um, if 
I work 50 hours, I'm going to get my original $280 for the 40 hours. Then I take 50 minus 40 and get 10 times 1050. So that's 105. So that would be $385. So at 50, I could be up here at 385. So you can kind of see that line is a little bit steeper. And that makes sense because slope is a rate of change. And we have a little bit steeper slope. So I'm going to change this. Instead of 10.5x, we're going to have plus 10.5x minus 60. So 220 plus 110.5x is my equation there. So how much will I get paid if I work 45 hours? 40 times 7 plus 5 times 1050. So that's going to be 280 plus 40 times 7 dollars plus 5, the 5 extra hours over 40 times 1050. So that's how that is.